Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Yes, call and response. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marcel Mateki Akita. I am the producer of Africa Rights Festival, which is brought to you by the Royal African Society, which happens to be celebrating its 120th anniversary this year. Um, I know, long time. Um, <laughs> it is a joy to have you here with us this weekend. It really is. It's been a really challenging year putting this festival together, but seeing you here is just, yeah, it's just a joy. I just wanted to extend that to you. Um, for its first biennial and ninth edition, the festival this year has run both online and physically since the 4th of October, as we adjust to this hybrid way of living. So with that said, I would like to um, extend a very special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. I don't know which camera to be looking at, but welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and today marks the first of our two-day in-person programming at the British Library, which concludes tomorrow with our headline conversation with Egyptian-American author and activist Mona El Tahawi. I know! <laughs> she is right here! <laughs> Um, trying not to fangirl too much. Okay, um, so please do, you'll see dotted around that there are some QR codes, so please do scan those to familiarize yourself with the program and also to share your feedback of how you've experienced the festival this year. We hope that you enjoy this session titled Sex Lives of African Women, a discussion with author Nana Dakwa Sekiyama, uh, with poetry uh, performed by Hibak Osman, Lydia Luke, and one of the women interviewed in the poem, Kuchenga will also share her thoughts of being interviewed in the collection. This discussion will be chaired by Desta Haile, Haile sorry, um, who is the Royal African Society's Deputy Director. Before I hand over to Desta, yes, I am still talking, sorry. I have a couple more housekeeping points uh, for you. Um, so for our live audience, for those of you who are joining us in this space physically, do please turn your mobile phones off or at least turn, put them on silent. Um, the second thing is we are not expecting any fire alarms this afternoon. So if you hear one, please follow the emergency exit signs. Um, and over to you, Desta and Nana Dakwa. I'll invite you both to the stage. Thank you. Can we please make some noise for Marcel and <laughs> team because they have put an incredible, incredible festival together under, as you know, these very tricky situations we've had. And it's such a great honour to be here today with you and to be discussing the sex lives of African women. Nana, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm so, so, so excited to be here. It's my first in-person event in London since the book came out in July. So it feels really special to be here at Africa Rights. I loved the book. How many people have read the book already or listened to the book? <laughs> yeah. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I had about 10,000 questions, but we're going to try and just uh, get a few in at least. And then we'll have time as well um, for the audience, also for our online audience, um, more online than in the room. So. Um, send your questions through and I should be able to get them on this little iPad. Yeah. So, um, after listening to the amazing book, um, it made me think of, uh, of a quotation from Alice Walker. Um, Sexuality is one of the ways we become enlightened actually because it leads us to self-knowledge. And one of the chapters of the collection is self-discovery. So I guess I wanted to start with one thing you learned about yourself, Nana, through the process of writing the book. Gosh, um, I think for me, writing is actually a way to try and understand myself. It's also a way for me to just try and figure out who I am. And part of what was really incredible about this book together, was about putting this book together, was the fact that as part of my process, I was interviewing African and Afro-descendant women from across the continent and the globe. So I feel like there was so much I was learning from each and every woman I interviewed, you know? Um, and actually, finishing the book makes me want to go deeper 
into exploring some of the themes of the book in my own life. Um, what did I learn about myself? I think I learned that I am super committed to the idea of freedom and to the idea of staying free, because I don't think it's easy to stay free as a woman. You know, I think it's very easy for us to bend and mold ourselves and fit into boxes and, you know, come across as appropriate. And this book is challenging me to, to always try and figure out who am I? Am I being true to myself? And am I staying true to myself? Um, and that's part of what I learned from this process. Amazing. So for those of you who don't know about the book yet, it's the result of years of interviews of women from across the continent, plunging into the entire spectrum of sexuality, relationships, freedom, and self-discovery um, through polygamy, queer communities, polyamory, religion, beyond. Um, so it's an incredible discovery. Each chapter is an incredible discovery. And even listening to it, and then I read it, read it, and yeah, it's just incredible. Um, so, and, and also, while we are here officially before uh, to introduce you, Nana Dakoa Sechiyama is a Ghanaian feminist activist and award-winning blogger, co-founder of the blog Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. Sechiyama is the Director of Communication at the Association for Women's Rights in Development. Um, she has written for The Guardian, This is Africa and Open Democracy, and spoken at Rightivism Festival in Kampala, Uganda, and Ake Arts and Book Festival in Nigeria. And The Sex Lives of African Women was published by Dialogue in just July. Yeah, in July. Amazing. OK, more questions. So um, since freedom is such a central part of the book, um, what does freedom mean to you? And who were some of your earliest role models or inspirations for freedom? It's a great question. Um, I feel like this is something that I will continue to think about and my definition and understanding of freedom will, will continue to change and evolve as I hopefully grow. But freedom for me means the ability to be true to myself, to be who I am. At the same time, it means the freedom to change who I am and not to feel like I need to stick with a particular identity. So it's also about being able to continuously learn, being able to con continuously grow, being able to continuously evolve and to have space and time and to be able to explore. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like the process of exploring, the process of discovering, the process of journeying is really important to, to, be, to be free. I feel like it's a dynamic process. It's, it's not the same and it changes. Um, and what freedom might look for me today may not be what freedom looks like for me in two years' time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of my biggest inspirations of freedom, um, it's really black feminist writers. I feel like I started to I, I understand myself when I started to read um, feminist theory, black feminist theory in particular. And some of the earliest feminists that influenced me, people like Bell Hooks, mm -hmm. people like Alice Walker, you know, um, a Ghanaian writer, Amata Idu, and in their work, I was like, oh my God, wow. <laughs> Everything you're saying really resonates with me. And those are women who are not scared to push against the grain. They're not scared to be themselves, mm -hmm. even if who they are is not popular or, you know, beloved by the majority of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Each, with each, uh with each story, there was a new definition of freedom, a new exploration. Um, always makes me think of that Nina Simone quote, freedom is no fear. Mm -hmm. um, before, that really resonates, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, I felt your book was just, uh, all the stories is just really courageous. Um, and, you know, sharing, putting this book out at a time where Ghana is trying to pass this completely homophobic, bill as mm -hmm. well um it's really it's really brave and really important the work that you're doing before we are uh, we uh, have a poem from hibak osman um let me ask you one more question there's so many questions i want to ask you just trying <laughs> to uh, i'm um, here to answer all the questions <laughs> <laughs> okay um how did you 
so you started your blog, Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, in 2009. So was it just a natural result of you being open with your stories that you built that community around? How did you start to create that community? Because it's so engaging. You have so many different people, guest writing on the blog as well. Um, how did that come about? How did you build that community? So I started Adventures with my best friend, Malaika Grant. And when we started, you know, I would sort of just like challenge myself to do things like I'm going to blog every day for the next two weeks, mm. you know, and I would do things like say I hooked up with somebody, the following day I'll be writing about it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was because like that's how I wanted to like analyze the experience. Yeah. At some point in time, I thought like I blog about sex. So if you're coming to hook up with me, surely you have to know what you're getting yourself into. You know, but I think the fact that I was sharing my own personal stories mm -hmm. really encouraged others to share. So people started to reach out to me, started to tell me their experiences, and I was like, do you want to contribute to the blog? And over time, there were some people, and up to now, you know, we just gave them their own usernames and passwords. Women I had never met before. I mean, for all I knew, they could have just crashed my site. <laughs> but I was like, you know, there were so many people wanting to share their stories, yeah. and obviously it's time consuming to upload everything. And it sort of came to me, this is called Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. It's not Adventures from Nanada Akwa's bedroom or Malaika's bedroom. <laughs> like, this has to be a space for all African women. And so, yes, let me entrust people and give them access to the blog. And I think we got very rich stories that way because, obviously, different people have different sexual identities, sexual experiences, come from different backgrounds. And so we then managed to sort of gather stories that actually reflected the whole range of African women's mm -hmm. experiences. And that trust you gave, I think, is very clear in the book because they returned that trust fully with the way they opened up um, with such uh, yeah, intimate details and struggles and fears. And yeah, so the trust you gave. Yeah, but I actually, it's funny because there's a connection, but there isn't a connection, right? Mm -hmm. So the woman who I interviewed for the for the for the book yes some of them had read adventures but they were not people who were writing for adventures okay you know um so i basically did call outs i approached strangers people i was having dinner with for the first time who seemed funky and i'm like i'm writing a book about sex can i interview you <laughs> you know i was on a trip in sao tome and i was like i want to interview someone from sao tome like especially as an african like Lusophon, you mm -hmm. know, speaking Africa seems so disconnected. So I knew I really wanted to interview someone from Sao Tome. And the tour guide was a nice, friendly guy. So I was like, do you know any Sao Tomean women who might want to, inter who might want to, you know, chat to me about the experiences of sex? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, I'll ask my friend, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. And then he was a translator for that conversation. So, yes. Um, but I think part of how the blog helped was... I think for some people, because they knew me from the blog, they trusted me. Mm -hmm. And I think it also just had given me lots of experience of speaking to women about a subject that's often considered personal, you know, and something that people don't talk about. So mm -hmm. I think I had the language to be able to speak to women and to be able to encourage women to open up and share their experiences yeah. with me. Amazing. Thank you. Um, maybe this would be a good time to have Hibak Osman's pre-recorded poem reading. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Hibak Osman, I'm a poet and today I'll be sharing with you a few poems and um, firstly starting with two pieces from my debut poetry collection and this one is titled Cravings. I said I love you like a sigh, full of regretful hope, full of can't you see me here dying to love you this world too small, these words too short, an encyclopedia of loving you falls from my lips into a hole in my torso where I swear to never release it. Really, I love you like a vulture, taking entire chunks of you into my mouth and padding my throat with your flesh until you say, enough. You have had your fill, leave some for tomorrow. But future is not currency here. I have no stakes in what may come. 
I say I love you like please a little more as if I cannot hear your pulse between my teeth. Thank you. Um, following on from that one, I will be reading a piece titled Dreaming in Parables. The mountains between us, now a new white sheet. You were a mirage, last slow burn of sun. On the day's losing is all we've got. I have emptied my heart beneath your laughter. Thought of open plains and the regrowth we are chasing. Don't spare me, love. Don't spare my love. Ignore the age creeping around our eyes. Swear I could feel you smile from cities over. When you say you want me, what does that look like? Find your limit like I find mine. Every sip of you, a testament to my strength. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> finally, I'll be reading uh, an entirely new piece, actually. So I'm very happy and honored to be sharing it as a part of Africa Writes Festival in honor of this um, amazing book, Sex Lives of African Women. And uh, it's a pleasure to read to you. I hope you enjoy it. It is titled Chosen. In these bodies, we have chased away the notion of forever, of binding, of an eclipse, to stay a little closer, to feel winds of breath across our tongues. We have chosen now, today, this evening filled with languid arms, legs, a laziness we are proud of, know each other's terrain better than we know our own, every curve and dip of skin, light slow enough to create a maze in, we have collected joy, sweat, the soft of lips on each pulse point, we say yes to slink slow days, turning into moonlight chased evenings, a rapture of our own, taunting the sun to claim two brown bodies bruised with want, sacrificial lambs to desire. We have chosen ourselves countless times over. We have perfectly sharpened years on our skin our teeth, edges formed out of broken promises. Let it be known that whatever we owe each other in day, we owe also at sunset. So turn to me and collect. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure reading to you. My name has been Hibak Osman. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so before I invite you to read Nana, I uh, just another question. A lot of the women you interviewed were from multiple places, multiple countries, multiple homes. And um, you speak about freedom as a safe home you can return to again and again. I guess I was really interested from your cultural studies and from all the countries you, you mentioned, how, how you think um, that may have influenced the stories that, that they shared, mm. being from so many places? Yes, no. I mean, for me, that breadth was really important. Um, and it was interesting to see the kind of commonalities that existed. But it was also really interesting to see how people's specific context had shaped not just who they were, but their experiences of sexuality. You know, um, and now I can't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> Just you mentioned how a lot of the the women came from uh, you know many different countries. Yes. Um, 
you know, uh, so yeah, that kind of multiple identities and nationalities, how that affected the stories they shared yes, or yes. the perceptive. Yes, the no, because people's backgrounds also mm. influenced how they felt about sex, right? Mm. Um, there was someone called Chantal, who's from Haiti, um, and when I interviewed her, I actually interviewed her in the States where she was living in Canada, and part of how she understands her sexuality is, as she understands her sexuality is earthy, mm. right? Because when she grew up, you know, her experience was of people who were literally close to the land, who were very physical, who would have their hands in the earth. And so for her, that's how she thought of sexuality. You know, um, and the fact that voodoo is a national religion in Haiti and that that's the goddess of sexuality, and part of what she said was part of what is celebrated in, in Haiti is just the rawness of sex. Mm -hmm. And for that's like part of her sexuality and that's part of her identity. You know, and for me, that was really beautiful to be able to see the connections between people's cultures, people con people's context, and how they understood their, their sexuality. I loved it. You took you take us everywhere: Cameroon, Kenya, Grenada, Costa Rica, Sao Tome, Egypt, Marrakesh, Nigeria, <laughs> New York, North Carolina, Brussels, everywhere. Um, and I have to say, like obviously, that's deliberate. And for me, also as somebody who's a Pan Africanist, that's a political choice. Yeah. Right. Um, Africa, we have the continent, and we also have, you know, many Africans who are not on the continent for reasons of slavery, colonization, migration. Um, and for me, the diaspora is part of the continent, and so it was really important to show that breadth. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, until a few years ago, I hadn't realized that there were people of African descent in Latin America. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, interviewing somebody from Costa Rica was really, really important, and somebody who understood themselves to mm -hmm. be an Afro descendant. Absolutely. Um, the the chapter that you brought up with Chantel, I loved how she describes. Uh, people working the earth or in the yes. rivers or because there's a lot that's online. You know, you talk about dating apps and, and internet website app love things. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's just really interesting because we have the whole tech side all the time. And then so it's just to have this story where it just came back to her associating sex with nature yes. and, and where she grew up in the land and the earthiness of it, like uh, she said, I thought that was really interesting. And you were kind of using digital spaces for your work way before we kind of were forced to this year. Um, so, and creating this incredible community. Um, before I ask you any more of these 10,000 questions, uh, maybe I could <laughs> invite you to, to read a chapter. Of your Absolutely, chapter? yes, and um, I'm actually going to read a chapter that will speak a little bit to the tech and the apps. Mm -hmm. So for people who want to follow, I will read from page 66. I'm reading Elizabeth's story. Um, and just to give a bit of background, she's a 44-year-old heterosexual woman of Nigerian and Scottish heritage. Um, and yes, I'm going to read from page 66. With all the men I've dated, I've always been their first girlfriend who is a wheelchair user. For some of them, they may have had a girlfriend who broke her leg and had to use a crutch or chair for a few months, but they've never been with anyone who was disabled. I remember one of my exes had dated someone who was deaf, but that was an exception. All the men I have been with have never been with anyone who has a physical disability. So for the men in my life, being with me is a new experience. Sometimes it can be awkward. They are not sure what to do. They wonder how much movement I have. They're not sure whether they can move me around. And I'm always like, do your thing, take control, be assertive. Move me how you want to move me. Tell me what you want me to do. Don't have any hangups or assume I'm going to feel uncomfortable in any scenario. I really can't stand passive men who wait for me to make the first move. I just think, oh please, this is not going to work. I have a strong personality, and so I need someone who can match that strength. We can still have that back and forth where we switch roles. I can take control and be the dominant one, but I'll get bored if I always have to be the lead. With some men, it's fine. The attitude is, screw it. I'm just going to do what, I'm not, what I normally do. I'm going to be dominant and possessive. I'm not going to treat her any differently to other women. That kind of confidence is a turn on for me. And then with other men, they're like, I'm not sure, is this okay? Are you all right with this? 
In my head, I'm thinking, please just stop talking. <laughs> You're breaking the flow, just do it. <laughs> I do a lot of online dating, and so I make sure to tell people before we meet that I'm in a wheelchair. I get different reactions. Some people say, this is not for me. And that's the last I'll hear from them. With those that keep on chatting, they'll very often ask, so can you have sex? Why is that even a question? Do men think people with disabilities are asexual? That they have no sexual feelings or desires? If someone wants to have sex, regardless of their disability, they will find a way. If desire is there and someone is willing, there is always a way to have sex. I always jokingly tell men, the only thing I can do is stand up and have sex. Besides, when is the last time you had sex standing up? <laughs> what positions do you usually have sex in? Most people have sex on their bed or on, or on some sort of surface. I'm fine, just so long as you don't expect me to stand up against the wall. If you can hold me against the wall, which I've also experienced, then that totally works too. On the flip side, I've also met some men via dating apps who are really turned on by the idea of being with a woman in a wheelchair. There was one guy I had been chatting to, we were already really attracted to each other, and then I told him I was in a chair. He then became even more intense and said, now I really need to have you. That felt creepy. It was like I had become some kind of fetish for him. With some other guys, sleeping with a woman in a chair is like ticking a box. I've slept with a blonde, I've slept with a black woman, I've slept with a woman in a chair. Then there are those folks I meet in real life. Maybe we meet at an event, we get chatting, and then they say something along these lines. I'm so intrigued by you. I want to know what it's like to have sex with you. Part of that is because I'm in a wheelchair. They are not interested in getting to know me as a person. If an element of the attraction is about the chair and I'm just an object of curiosity to them, it's really off-putting. If a guy is drawn to me and wants to have sex with me, that's fine, but I'm not some kind of circus freak. What happens once we've had sex and you've satisfied your curiosity? The worst are those men who have some sort of God complex. Those who think they have a healing dick. <laughs> men tell me that if I have sex with you, you'll be able to walk. <laughs> this has happened twice now. <laughs> Granted, one of those experiences was when I was much younger. <laughs> I think this is a good place to stop, actually. <laughs> I was wondering how much um, you know you you edited when you got the stories because the stories made me crack up. Some really you know made me sad. Um, yeah, and but this this they're so different. They're from everywhere. They're all ages, but there's a, a kind of a, a unifying thread throughout. Um, yeah, so I was wondering how how much you edited the stories that were shared with you. Yes, so. You know, basically I had a conversation with people and some people we had multiple conversations and some people we had like one really long conversation and I would obviously have to like transcribe everything and I would look back on our conversation and think, okay, what is the story here? Mm -hmm. You know, so I would pick what I wanted to focus on, what I felt was most interesting, what was most compelling. Um, and then I would presents that story in a way that I think would be interesting and enjoyable for you to all read or listen to, mm -hmm. you know? So I didn't just sort of share what people told me in the way they told me, mm -hmm. um, but everybody's story is true. So I also didn't put words in people's mouths, yeah. but because I already knew in a sense that way in which I wanted to tell the story, because I knew I wanted to be able to tell the story creatively, I would ask lots of really intimate questions. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? What happened? What could you see? What did you feel? You know, because I knew that I wanted to be able to almost embody everybody as I wrote their story, and I wanted to write their story in the first person, mm -hmm. you know? So, in a sense, it's my story based on their experiences. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, you've included 
Elizabeth's story, uh, and she speaks to her disabi disability. You included the amazing Fatu, who's 60 and rocking it. Um, so I'm curious as to what feedback you've had so far, because you know, ageism's real, and the women you feature just you know, pay no attention to it. So wondering what um, those more marginalized audiences have, have fed back to you since it's, the book's come out. I mean, the feedback I've had so far has been extremely positive. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people have been wanting a book like this for a while, a book that speaks to the breadth of African women's experiences around sex and sexuality. Um, obviously, some people have been shocked. Um, a good friend of mine bought the book and her dad saw it, and her dad read it before her and apparently told his wife, we shouldn't let her read the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and part of what I've loved is people are buying the books for their moms, for their aunties, mm -hmm. which I didn't think necessarily of people buying the book for their moms and aunties. I expected them to buy it for their sisters and friends. But that's also been really nice. Mm -hmm. um, so far, feedback has been positive. Yeah. No, it's, it's brilliant. It'll only grow and grow. Um, let me see. Healing is another one of the sections of the book. And, and you mentioned how healing, uh, how writing the book was healing and, and speaking to it. But was there anything else you discovered that was healing during the time you were writing? I think I discovered that healing looks different for everybody. Mm -hmm. What one person finds healing is not, right? So there was a woman who spoke about how literally having sex was part of how she got out and managed to live with depression, mm. you know? And there was also a woman who went celibate for a long time, you know, as a way to also heal. For a thousand days. Yes, I know, right? I was like, that can never be me. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that's not going to be my form of healing. <laughs> So it, yeah, so healing just really, really looks very different. I think the main takeaway is, is about trying to create space and time to mm -hmm. heal and being intentional about it. That was definitely a lesson. Mm -hmm. I know for myself, I don't feel like I have been intentional about healing and it's something that the book is inspiring me to want to create space and time in my life to do. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's going to be healing for so many people reading it, you know, or listening to it. Um, it's, it's just hearing the stories shared like that, it just opens doors to questions or understanding or um, it made me think of, you know, during the whole Me Too movement, so many friends that I had known for years and years and I thought I knew so well were opening up about things that they'd never felt able to share uh, until they started hearing other women's stories. So your book is definitely going to be healing to thousands, millions. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Maybe this would be a good time for us to invite Kuchenga to share her. Yes, that would be great. Hello, my name is Kuchenga and I'm a writer and a journalist. And I first met Nana um, via Charmaine Lovegrove, the premier British publisher um, in the UK. and. I was so honoured to be involved in the sex lives of African women and um, the conversation was one of my highlights of 2020 and I feel reflecting on it, it was one of my biggest commitments to shirk off the shackles of respectability and to contribute in deepening the complexity with which we regard um, black women's lives. So thank you so much for the involvement Nana, I really appreciate it. And today I will be reading from my contribution. <clears throat> Going to the therapy in my late twenties and finally getting sober. <clears throat> Going to therapy in my late twenties and finally getting sober gave me the confidence to finally live as myself. That was when I read Janet Mock's Redefining Realness and found black trans women like Cat Black and groups like the Teen Time Network that gave me the language that enabled me to name myself and a vision for my own life. I had never wanted that much for myself. My self-esteem was so low. My expectations for my life were even lower. As time went on, I started to learn more about how the stories of trans people had been suppressed through the ages 
understanding that history helped me understand my own past and my youthful wildness. Although I still face transphobia now, at least I have confidence within myself. I have hustled a career for myself as a freelance journalist. I have bylines in the likes of Harper's Bazaar and Vogue. I have literally pulled myself up by my bootstraps, but I also have a lot of class privilege, even though my own background is lower middle class. My mum worked in local government and my dad was a secondary school teacher who came to the UK from Zimbabwe. I went to university and I am hella bougie, <laughs> though through my education experiences, I have had a lot of access to straight white men. And the men I've been in with relationships with have paid for my writing courses, my rent. They paid for me to go to rehab, took me on holidays and bought me food. All that has been materially beneficial to my life and helped me get to where I am now. At the same time, I don't want to say to another black trans girl, girl, you need to do this. There's nothing progressive in saying you just need to suck the right dick or you just need to find the right white man. It's not reparations. If you have to put in the labour of sex, boost their ego and perform emotional labour, that's not reparations. That's really difficult work. I am fatigued. So I know how much work it is. The admin, the promotion, the reputation management, the need to constantly schmooze and network. It's a lot. For, the long t for a long time, I tried to keep the sex work I did a secret. I tried so hard to find a job that I thought was worthy of me. I have a French degree. I have worked in education and hospitality. I would have loved to have worked at one of the major galleries, publishers, charities or retailers. I've applied for those jobs. I've applied for hundreds of jobs. I've applied for jobs where the pay is £10 an hour and jobs where the pay is £35,000 a year. Those white liberal folks are simply not interested in hiring me. They do not want me. A black trans woman, even in those circumstances where I've been given an interview, I could see the disdain written on their faces. I moved from London to Portsmouth to Brighton and my experiences were the same. The truth is, the life of being a writer slash activist was not paying the bills. I was constantly borrowing £20 from my sister. I will do anything to continue to focus on my passion, which is to write, document and archive. Thank you. Did anything surprise you during the process of writing the book? I think what surprised me was how many women had experienced child sexual abuse. Mm. I don't think I really expected that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So when I first started interviewing people, I would ask a particular question. And it took me a while to realize, in a sense, that question was triggering people's memories of child sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And the question was, what's your earliest sexual memory? You know? And so at some point in time, I stopped asking that question because it was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. that surprised me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, something I, I wanted to ask you as well was, um, I felt the language was really malleable, really flexible. You have people, <coughs> excuse me, inventing their own titles. Um, and there's a, <coughs> excuse me. There's a freedom and flexibility with today's generation that there hasn't always been. So how that affected your writing as well? Yeah. So I would always start off by asking people how they, how they identified in terms of their gender and in terms of their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. You know. So each story starts with a little sort of preamble which says how the person identified. And for me, that was really important because I think that's also part of freedom, right? Mm. The ability to self-identify and say who we are and to define who we are for ourselves. And so, yes, I refer to people how they identified. And so sometimes you find like the different types of terms and terminologies, you know, that's deliberate because I wanted to reflect the reality of we, we identify ourselves in different ways, yeah. So some people describe themselves as the same gender love in person. Somebody also say I'm a lesbian. Somebody will say I'm queer. You know, somebody will say I'm bicurious. Yeah. I feel the book is really vital because, as you mentioned, you know, in your motivations for writing it, there's limited access to <clears throat> comprehensive sex education. 
So how can how can we help your book, you know, play a role in changing that besides telling our <laughs> local libraries, you know, you need to have this book. Um, how can because your your book is so impactful and can really it is an education in itself. So how can readers help boost that? It's a great question. It's a great question. I mean, I feel like there's so much. I feel like readers are so powerful, right? Like, just the mere fact that you've read the book, you tell your friends about the book, you know, um, if you're connected to academic institutions, you know, you ask them to maybe even include the book in the curriculum. You know, I can imagine this being a perfect fit for, like, gender studies and women's studies and African studies departments. And, yeah, just... Please share. <laughs> definitely, definitely, we'll share. Um, oh, so many questions. <laughs> um, feel free to send in your questions too online, um, so that we can we can include them to Banana in a few minutes. Um, pleasure is political. And, uh, and, and you create space for this. I think in terms of adding to education, you also add to activism and activist work because you, you create this really empowering space where people are safe to share their stories and to um, share these journeys. So how do you feel that the Sex Lives of African Women has helped support these activist groups across the continent? Because you mentioned people doing amazing work in, in Ghana. Um, I know there's incredible, like, House of Guramaile, um, supporting in Ethiopia. So how do you feel the book has linked activists or been inspired by activists? Yes, I mean, I consider myself as a feminist activist. It's, mm -hmm. like, probably my primary, most important identity. And I wouldn't do this book if I wasn't an activist, you know, in a sense, as part of my contribution to African feminist, um, I guess, knowledge production. You know, African feminists have been producing knowledge around sex and sexuality. It's just that, unfortunately, we don't always get access to mainstream publishing platforms, you know? So, you know, my four mothers include um, Dr. Sylvia Tamale, for example, um, Hak Hakima Abbas, Sukari Ikin. So I think of this as just a contribution to that body of knowledge, um, yeah. And was there a second part to your question? No, that's, that's okay. perfect. You, I, remember, <laughs> I remember you actually, you've given so many great, um, great resources as well. It, you know, books you've read, uh, The Queer African Readers. Yes, The Queer African Readers by well. Hakim Abbas and Sukari Akin. Yeah. Yeah, and Dr. Sylvia Tamale, The African Sexualities Reader, is a whole compilation. Um, another book that I also really loved, which is published by, um, Kasava Republic Press is She Called Me a Woman, mm -hmm. you know, which is edited by Rafiat, Chitra, and Azina. Um, and also, like, lots of online platforms, you know, Hola Africa, mm -hmm. The Spread, which is a podcast in Kenya by Kaz. Um, Tiffany Mugu has a great book, The Quirky Quick Guide to Sex. Yes. You know, Dr. T has an incredible book, which is about sexuality and reproductive health. Like, African feminists, we've been doing this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you share a lot about, about the works that have inspired you, the women that have inspired you um, in the process. Um, uh, so besides being an incredible book um, and a blog before that, there are big, big plans around. <laughs> so can you tell us a bit more about, I'm really curious to learn about the festival, which is happening now, November. Um, if you could tell us a bit more about Transformational Adventures 2021 Sex Power Magic the <laughs> Festival. How can we get involved? How can people join? No, thanks for mentioning that. So Adventures very much started as an online space. And three years ago, we thought we wanted to create a regular space for people to actually meet, meet face to face and, you know, and discuss the same sort of issues and themes we discuss in the festival. So in 2019, we held our first in-person event in Accra, Ghana. Mm -hmm. We did the same last year. And this year, really because of increased homophobia in Ghana, mm. we've decided to hold our festival only virtually. Whereas like last year, for example, it was hybrid, very much like this festival. You know, um, so Sex, Power and Magic is the theme for this year's festival. 
Um, everything is virtual. We've had some conversations already, so people can visit our YouTube page and check out some of those incredible sessions. But on the 6th and 7th, we have like our, I guess, our headline events as well. Um, next, and Next weekend? Yes. Oh, two weeks, okay. Yeah, in two weeks' time, okay. yeah. And it's been really incredible to be able to, you know, have these conversations in online spaces as well yeah. as, you know, in a mixture, in a mixture of spaces, yes. And a film, a series in the works? <laughs> so for Adventures, um, there's a filmmaker called Nusa Garrick who wants to produce a series um, inspired by the blog. So that is, that is super exciting. That's going to be her project. I'm sort of just behind. I'm, I'm just like there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but it's really exciting. Yeah. Amazing. Well, you, you've already, you already created all these incredible digital spaces before this year, but have you noticed a change in, I guess, more people are willing to join online festivals in a way that they might not have been in 2019, but have you noticed uh, any kind of difference in communication or with your network or community over the pandemic? I know um, you, you mentioned that in terms of safety, keeping activists safe online was the best option. Um, but yeah, have you, do you feel you've reached more people or people have started sharing in a different way? Mm, it's a really great, it's a really great question. I mean, I feel like the reverse has happened, right? And I feel like people are thirsty for in-person events, you mm. know, and I feel like people are tired from being <laughs> online and it's exhausting. I, f I personally feel like the audience online was larger mm -hmm. in the past than it is now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and especially in terms of sex, everyone being confined and separated. And <laughs> what has become more popular are articles that talk about how to have sex in the COVID era. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A, a poet who will be reading for us later, Lydia Luke, has a great poem called Loving COVID-19. Loving... No, but find it online because it's great and it's about sex. Think of <laughs> well, I love that point. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Nana. Um, let me see, let me see. One of the so many, so many beautiful parts of the book that really made me stop and think because it's all about sex, but sex and spirituality, sex and self-discovery, sex and freedom, sex and um, creating a life that empowers ourselves and others. Um, made me think of, there's an Audre Lorde quote, uh, erotic as the deepest life force, a force which moves us toward living in a fundamental way. And when I say living, I mean it as a force which moves us toward what will accomplish real positive change. And I really felt that's kind of a, a pulse throughout the stories that, you, that you've gathered so caringly. Um, and Ebony says something um, that she asks herself, every day she asks herself, Are, am I happy today? Mm. And if the answer is no, I make a change. So what, how has this book changed your life or your work so far? Oh, wow. <laughs> how has this book changed my life and my work so far? I guess it's a feminine to me that this is something I want to continue doing, mm -hmm. you know. I've been writing about sex since 2009. I'm not tired of writing about sex. Mm -hmm. There's so much more I want to write about sex. I think it's super important. Like you mentioned, I think it's political. If it wasn't political, we wouldn't have states trying to legislate who we can love and how we can love. Yeah. Um, I feel like if we can free ourselves in our personal lives, we can free ourselves in our public lives and in every area of life, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think sex is interconnected to all the aspects, you know, of our lives. Um, yeah, so I guess how this book has, has changed my life is, it's given me more of a public platform, a larger public platform mm -hmm. than I already had. And it's affirmed to me that this is something that's valuable to do. This is something that people are thirsty for. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's worthwhile continuing to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Were there any stories, because you must have had so many to choose from, um, were there any stories that um, when people, did anybody hesitate 
Did anybody reach out afterwards and say like, oh, I'm not sure, or can you edit this, or? So I didn't give people the chance to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't, I was very deliberate about it. I thought about it, I thought, okay, when I write people's story, should I send it to them? And I made a deliberate decision not to. Because I think, you know, because like I, I explained the process of writing the book, right? And sometimes when you tell people a story, they see something that you don't quite see, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's sometimes the most interesting thing. And we're human beings. We like to all show ourselves and, you know, the best light. I didn't want people to put an Instagram filter mm. over their stories. <laughs> and so I didn't give them, them the chance. So some people ask me, will I get to see it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> 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 and so for me, like, this period of this book being out in the world, it's also been, I was most nervous about how are the women who I interviewed going to find the stories, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's been really interesting hearing their feedback. And, you know, people have said to me, oh my God, I was like, why did I tell Nana all of this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and somebody was like, oh my God, why did I not like remain anonymous? But they've all said they're very happy with it. Mm -hmm. And they're happy they told me their story. And I'm happy they did and they trusted me. Um, yeah. The trust is, is yeah, it, you feel it, listening to it. Um, I was, I guess I was, I'd like to know how, I mean, you, you had conversations, it was very natural, but whether there was anything in particular you did besides sharing your own story that helped set up that safe space um, for them to share their whole lives with you like that. Because I'm sure some of them you, you hadn't known for long, or they were strangers. Sometimes it's easier to talk to strangers, but how did you ensure that um, they felt confident and comfortable to share those stories with you? I think my process changed, you know, at the beginning, because this was very new to me. The very first person I interviewed for this book is a woman called Baba, you know, and the first time, like she had slid into my DMs to ask me a couple of questions because she was confused about her sexuality. And I was trying to reassure her. And then I was like, oh, can I interview you? I'm going to write a book. And she was like, yeah. And so she, she because we lived in the same country, she came to my house and we just drank a bottle of wine and just got to know each other. And we didn't actually chat about the book. Mm. And then she came again and then we drank more wine. <laughs> <laughs> And then I started the process of interviewing her, and then we did a third interview. But by the end, you know, it will just be Zoom. Hi, my name is Sanada Akwa. I'm working on this book. Da, da, da. And then we'll just get straight to the point. So I felt like it was more about me getting comfortable, mm -hmm. you know? And I think once I was comfortable, it was also easier for people to just open up to me. So you, you interview people all over the world, and journeying, travel is a big theme, culture is a big theme. Um, I guess I was wondering if there's, during the time that you were writing, uh, whether there was a specific journey that you took, either mm -hmm. actually physically or metaphorically, that really shaped you during the time you were working on the book? Mm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So after I, after Dialogue bought the book, I was just like, oh my God, now I have to finish the book. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I think we sold the book, Robert. My agent is here. Hi, Robert. Hi. Yes. I think Robert sold the book in like October 2019. And then it was December. And December is such a fun time in Ghana. I was partying so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get back into the book. So I reached out to my friend, Aisha Haruna Atta. Her book is actually out. Um, and you can buy it in the bookshop out. And I was like, I need to get back into my book. So I went to her. She lives in Senegal in a little like seaside town called Pupengin and I went mm. there and you know she gave me a home I had a little like apartment in her house and I wrote there I did some of my interviews then that was really helpful that was a really good way to get back into the book and you know it's also nice to sort of reflect on your own life when you're in a different space mm. yeah I you you thank uh, a mutual friend uh, at the end you mentioned Mina Salami and I remember asking Mina once how do you know when it's done? How do you know when it's ready? And she was just like, you just know. <laughs> so how did you know when it was ready? Because you could have, no doubt, included a thousand more stories. It's really helpful to have a deadline by which your publisher wants the book. <laughs> <laughs> your agent there like, no, no. <laughs> it's 
first time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but yes, I mean, when I first started, I, I thought, oh, I want to interview 54 women to represent the 54 countries on the continent. And then I think we got more countries, and I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I think once I hit 30, I felt like, oh, this is a good enough number. You know, mm. there's enough breadth here, and there's enough depth here, and... I could have continued. I can even now still think of more stories that I'd want to include, but I had to stop at some point in time. You know, we're already waiting for the sex lives of African women too. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll be here. We'll be waiting. We'll go to the festival and uh, we'll keep going to the festivals and reading the blogs until <laughs> until the second one comes out. Um, but no, it was really incredible, and uh, I'm on my my second way through it, and mm. you just learn more and just the range, the depths, the, the humor, the pain. Um, it's incredible the way you've carved out this space uh, for the people sharing their stories, but uh, also for the readers and the, the listeners. And I want to encourage people to consume this book in the various forms because it also exists as an audio book. And mm. I really enjoyed listening to the audio. Me too. You know, I was a bit nervous. I'm like... Hmm, will they pronounce the names right? Yeah. I think they did a pretty good job. And yeah. it was like really a different experience. Yeah, yeah, it was like a conversation. Yes. Or listening in on your conversation yes. uh, with them. It was beautiful. Um, so many questions. But <laughs> let me open up the floor to you. Um, if you're online, I think there's a link under the video where you can... Uh, Type your question in, and it should pop up on this iPad. Uh, but otherwise, there was somebody I think at the back we have a up. microphone. Yes. Jeez, it's so amazing to see people and be doing something in public. And uh, oh, it's oh, at the back. Oh. Maybe if we could give the microphone to the lady there. Hi, Nana. Um, data seems to show that previous generations have more sex than this generation. Um, so I just wanted to, to know, is this something that was reflected in the, in the interviews that you had? And mm -hmm. if yes, why do you think so? Do you want me to answer Thank each you. question or like answer? Maybe answer each question because my memory is like a Let's sieve. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's actually really interesting. I had no idea that this is what data shows. But one of the older women I interviewed, Fatu, you know, I loved that she was just like, I have no idea how many people I've slept with. I've slept with, like, so many people, <laughs> you know? I feel like older African women have a sort of freeness around sex that, mm. you know, contemporary African women don't have. Um, you know... I guess, in a sense, my sort of first oral history project was with my grand aunt, and I interviewed her about her life. And mm. when she died, she was like 100 or 101. Wow. And I didn't know until I interviewed her that she'd had three husbands. It was just like a casual wow. matter of fact then. Meanwhile, imagine if I tried to marry three men, what people would say to me today. <laughs> so I think there's definitely a sort of freeness, especially those women who were like in the pre colonial times had, you know, that we. We don't have, mm. yeah, yeah. A Kenyan friend of mine sent me a, a really funny video. It's like four minutes long, and it's it's. They, I don't know if they know what they're going to be asked. I don't think they do. But the interviewer is like, "How many people have you slept with?" And you just see the reactions. <laughs> some people are like, "Oh, hundred or whatever." And some people are like, "Oh, um, well, if you uh, maybe." Uh. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's funny what uh, people feel comfortable sharing. Um, next question, please. Hi, Nana, and thank you very much for organizing this. Um, just from what I've... I haven't read the book yet, and from what I've heard, I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. So my question is a bit cheeky, but easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing to do with sex, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I set up a small uh, a book club with uh, there's just five of us, myself and four of my friends, and I've already recommended the book for our next read in December, so I've got all the copies here you'll sign them later. Um, my question is, would you, because we review it at the end of the month uh, in December, would you join, be able to join us for Absolutely, an hour to talk about I it? Would. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure.
Natasha. Cool. I'll give you my email before I leave. Yes. <laughs> She's got a question. Question over She's here. Question. <laughs> Hi, Nana. Hi. Hello. Um, so I'm, I think, 80-something pages uh, through the book, and um, one of the, I guess, people that spoke to me the most was of course Elizabeth the uh, wheelchair user but um, one that really touched me the most I feel was um, the Kenyan sex worker towards the Ooh. beginning with her son that wanted to be a pastor and like for me it really well first of all that made me cry because like you know learning about her story and then the fact that she was able to raise just this beautiful son who's so open and welcoming and loving of everybody like was there a particular page or particular person's example that actually had you tearing up or was it mm. that one so yeah <sighs> no that's a great question um yeah Philister's story I think is one that like sticks with you mm. you know um and definitely was one of those stories that really moved me emotionally. Um, but for me also personally, Titi's story, Titi from, you probably haven't gotten there yet. So she's from Zimbabwe. She's a woman living with HIV. You know, and part of what is really nice is, you know, she found love, got married, had a child who's free of HIV. Um, but then learning how, you know, she fell ill was like tough. Yeah. And how it affected her for a long time. And so she found the strength to like, you know, um, yeah, and she found the strength to sort of move on with her life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to us chatting afterwards. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a beautiful, I think, through theme, how each one found strength or found um, support, like with Phyllis, the, uh, the Kenya Sex Workers Alliance, so yes. the, the different groups that were formed to support each other. And yes. that's, that's, yeah, that comes back a lot. It's beautiful. Um, more questions? Yeah. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much. And uh, you just seem like such a fantastic and hilarious writer, so I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, my question was like related to the fact that you interviewed both women on the continent and women in the diaspora. And does that was there a difference and was there sort of patterns or parallels that you could see? And I'm just thinking of my own experiences as an African woman who has been raised though in the UK um, and how much racial politics comes into play in a way that it doesn't for my mother or it didn't for you know, people before me. Um, and is there anything that you can you know, help these women learn <laughs> from each other? Mm -hmm. Hmm. No, that's an excellent question. I feel like there's some stories that people had that co they could have only experienced in the diaspora. Hmm. Um, so there's a story by a woman called Maureen, for example, um, who grew up in France. And she was speaking to basically how she felt invisible as a black woman, hmm. right? And how for years she'd only dated white men. And it took her a while to realize that that was also internalized racism. Hmm. And how black women are never shown as you know, women who deserve to be partnered. And I think we still see this in French film today, right? What's that popular show that a lot of us... Uh, look at, exactly, yeah. and it's like... Exactly, you know, so, yeah. And, exactly. And I feel like that's an experience that people will only have in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, too, even between Africans in the diaspora and those on the continent, you could see so many commonalities in terms of how like respectability politics, right? And don't disgrace the family mm. and all of that. That was like a common theme across whether people were in the diaspora or on the continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think race made a difference outside, basically. Yeah. Hi, Nana, I'm Anna. I'm one of the Pleasure Prop um, Fellows with Annie. So she oh, says cool. hi. hi. Um, I, my first question is, um, I'm, I'm a Filipina, so Asian women are also hypersexualized in the same way that black women are. How did you, when the women that you interviewed, how did they process this kind of stereotype that kind of looms over us of being hypersexualized? How do they deal with that? And secondly, how do they define pleasure? Mm, mm. 
No, those are excellent questions. I mean, I think different people define pleasure in different ways. And a lot of women were, in a sense, on a journey of self-discovery to figure out what pleasure meant for them. In terms of how people dealt with being hypersexualized, the person that comes to mind again is Maureen that I was mentioning, you know, mm -hmm. because she realized that for a lot of the white men who were dating her, they were dating her because she was black, because they had a particular perception of black women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were some people who were saying, oh, when I was a child, I used to lo watch lots of videos on MTV and see black women shaking their asses. And so, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think it's sad because people want to be seen as human beings and as individuals and not be fetishized or exoticized. Yeah. Thanks. Question over there. Hi, thank you, Nana. My name's Dami. Um, religion plays quite a huge role in the African context, both on the continent and in the diaspora. How do you feel African women relate to their sexuality comparing our traditional African religions to the more Abrahamic religions that now have more popularity on the continent? I love that question. Because that was, again, I guess one of the themes that kind of surprised me. Spirituality came across really, really, really strongly. And, you know, um, there's one particular woman, Nura, her, her story is the one that starts the book, and she said for herself, sex and spirituality were like two sides of the same coin, which mm -hmm. I think is like interesting, you know? Um, and what I observed, at least from those that I interviewed, and I can't say if that's true for real life, but just based on the stories, I felt like for a lot of people, a lot of women, Islam, actually sort of opened up avenues for their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of Christians, their Christianity and actually repressed their sexuality, right? And it was like hard for them to come into their sexuality because of what they had been told about sex. Usually mm -hmm. don't have it or wait until you're married. And then it's like, mm -hmm. marriage is not happening. And you know, I'm supposed to be holding on for my husband. But that was a really common thread. And part of what was really nice about um, Chantal's story, you know, and speaking about voodoo, it was like there was permission in voodoo to be vulgar and to be loud and to be sexual, mm. you know? Um, I don't think, I don't think I interviewed anybody who, I think Fatu does, who in a sense practiced African traditional religion. I think probably Fatu, but we didn't really speak about that. So I don't know what connections people would have, you know, in terms of African traditional religion. Um, but yeah, especially for Christians, you know, their, their religion and their upbringing had been part of what had limited their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And didn't Fatu say that she felt marriage was there to just trick women into? <laughs> <laughs> she did. Yeah. 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 No, I, Fatu, I loved Fatu. This question there? Hi, Nana, thank you. Um, you said you were surprised at the number of African women who were abused as children. Did you f find any difference between how they experience sex, women who were abused as children, how they experience sex in African women who were not? Because sex is a big taboo in, in Africa, across Africa. So I just want to ask you. If no, it's a great question. Case. I mean, the thing is, because I didn't want to at some point in time hear about child sexual abuse anymore. I stopped mm. asking the question that would trigger people. So I, th I don't think I can make a correlation, right? But part of what was really nice for me is lots of the women who had experienced child sexual abuse had gone on to have really, really incredible sex lives. You know, um, one woman comes to mind, her name is Juarez. She experienced FGM as a child. Mm -hmm. And part of what was refreshing for me was she expressed, she said FGM is child sexual abuse. And honestly, I had never thought about it as that, you know, but that's what it is. Like, I think we sensationalize it in the West, but it is basically child sexual abuse and child sexual abuse happens everywhere, yeah. you know? And then like later on, she was telling me about this incredible vagus nerve orgasm she'd had, you know? And I was just like, wow, because in my mind, even me, as somebody who's been writing about sex and sexuality, I hadn't really thought that women who had experienced FGM or cotton could experience like that kind of sexual pleasure. Okay. So for me, myself, there was a lot of re-education, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Amazing. Other questions? She, oh, iPad. Okay, iPad, <laughs> okay. Oh, this is high tech. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Rami. Uh, okay. So from he's uh, his name's Rami. He's French. He lives in the UK. He works at the University of Cambridge. And he asks, "Do you think sex shapes our state of mind and our own self-value? Do you think sex can help us? Uh, can help free us more in our spirit?" Uh, I hope I make sense, and I apologize for my English. Don't apologize, Rami. You're doing great. Um, yes. So, no, I absolutely think sex can free us, especially when it is sometimes what imprisons us, right? We're told, don't do it. You can only do it under certain conditions. Mm. So I think doing it under the conditions you want to do it can be an act of freedom. And it's also a practice, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that continuous practice is also a way to free yourself. I mean, I know for myself, um, sharing a personal story, I married the first guy I had sex with. And then when that marriage ended, I wanted to sleep with so many people. <laughs> <laughs> And I did, you know, I had my, <laughs> I had my whole phase and was super free and I recommend everybody has a whole phase. <laughs> um, Rami is back already. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, how to break the barrier that that exists with you know talking about sex. For example, if if um, he asks if I if I want to open the mind of my my mother or my cousins mm -hmm. who are from Djibouti, but you know there's a huge cultural taboo about talking about it. How do I start to do that? Wow, that's tough. That's tough. I feel like go gently. You know, ask easy questions. Mm. You know. Yeah, may, yeah, maybe ask easy questions about what it was like for them growing up and, you know, like how did they feel when they met, like say you're talking to your mother, how did they feel when they met your father, mm -hmm. if there's a father in the picture. I feel like just ask like easy, soft questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes parents will surprise you if you like, you just ask them like, you know, like we didn't just appear here by <laughs> magic. <laughs> <laughs> You know, or, or maybe if you're a student, you can make it seem like you're doing research. Mm. <laughs> and so maybe I want to know how our ancestors did this. Yeah. 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 Or give them this book and ask them to read it and ask them, I, yeah. <laughs> ask them what they think. <laughs> I think those surprises often come when you don't ask. If you ask them, I feel sometimes it's like you get evaded. Mm -hmm. You'll be in the middle of dinner minding your business and then they'll say, oh, I remember when I dated you. What? Yeah. 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 <laughs> those kind of come out of the blue. Um, okay, we have one more here, but are there any other questions from the audience? Over there, please. Hi, um, I just want to say thank you for writing the book. It actually inspired me to write my dissertation, so hey. thank you so much. Um, so based on that, I just have like sort of two more methodological questions. Um, I firstly wanted to ask like, how you dealt with like the risk of losing something in translation. You said you had um, an interview that was conducted in Portuguese with a lady mm. from Sao Tome. No, that's a great question. You know the interesting thing about when somebody's translating for you, you can tell when they haven't said what you said. Uh -huh. <laughs> so when this guy was translating, for, before we started, I said, just say exactly what I say. Don't try and explain it. Mm. Just say it. And there's so many times I would be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> say what I said, you know, because you're trying to explain. I'm like, no, 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 just say what I said, you know? Um, and so I think that's how I dealt with it, yeah. But obviously, if you have a trusted translator, somebody you know, ideally somebody whose politics aligns to yours, mm -hmm. you know, especially if language is important, I think it would be good to work with somebody you know. Okay, yeah. thank you. And the second question was, um, sort of why did you decide not to do like sort of a more traditional anthropological analysis with the stories you got? Why did you decide to just leave their voices as they were? What would a more anthropological analysis look just like? Just like sort of analyzing, like, cause you had at the start of um, each section, you had like a brief like sort of 
two mm -hmm. or three pages about the themes. But I was just wondering where, um, why you decided not to draw connections between the two explicit, um, all of them explicitly. Oh yeah, I think I wanted people to like make up their minds for themselves and come up to their own conclusions. And I didn't want to be overly academic, you know, which was like to try and make the book hopefully mm. more accessible. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Question over here. Hi, um, I just wondered about mothers. I'm thinking about my own mother and total lack of discussions about sex growing up. Um, how did the women, any of the women, or was there a theme around the lack of discussion with mothers or the word, word discussion? That, that, that was a question on my mind. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, don't, I think there was just one person <laughs> who, like, her mother knew about her sex life and was like, you, you can have sex at home. There's no need to go and have sex in the corners, you know, in the bushes <laughs> or anything. But it was very common. <laughs> It was very, very common for people to feel that they never got told about sex mm. or, you know, they never had a conversation about sex and, mm. I, I mean, any basic conversation, let alone comprehensive sex education. But, you know, and sort of like maybe in defense of some mothers, I feel like sometimes they think they told you. Mm. Um, many years ago, <laughs> many years ago, I was on BBC and um, my mom was listening. And I said, I didn't have any sex education. She texted me, that is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess maybe she felt she educated me, but that's not the kind of education I wanted, right? I wanted something that was more direct and more explicit. And I think, like, for me, that's really encouraging because actually everybody says they wanted their parents to talk to them about sex. Mm. Like, they wanted an open conversation about sex, an honest conversation about sex. They didn't want to have to try and figure it out for themselves, you know? And for me as a young mother, that's encouraging. Um, yeah. And you dedicate the book to your daughter as well. I do, so, I do. Yeah. yeah. No, it's... I love this book. I'm going to read it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> More questions from there? Hi, um, I'm Nikki, and I wanted to ask a question that um, basically we can't unfortunately talk about sex lives of women and African women without also centering trauma. And you did a lot of sitting down with people to talk about their experiences, and some of this would have been you listening to stories that would have been heartbreaking, and you talk about mm -hmm. you know stopping a particular question because of this. I want to know how through your journey of talking about sex over you know the last decade or plus how you've managed to still centre joy without sort of absorbing a lot of those traumatic narratives when talking to other people, but also in your own experiences of sex. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. I think for me, like, joy is also important and political, mm. you know, and I feel like you have to actually consciously create space for joy. And joy is also part of the way we get over trauma and difficult experiences. And so, yes, in my writing about sex, I have chosen to centre joy. I also feel like as... African women as black women, you know, the world often looks to learn about our trauma and mm. know about our experiences of joy and pleasure. And so for me, it's also like a conscious political choice to talk about pleasure and to encourage us to have more pleasurable lives and to make space and time to like have fun and explore and be happy and joyful in the world. Mm. Yeah. No, your book does that with so much grace. Um, and even the way it's set up, even when it is a, a heartbreaking story, there's hope in each story, I feel, the way you've, you've sculpted it as well. And, and as much as there are, are tears, there's also moments that just crack me up in the book as well. So you, you capture all of that beautifully. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Any more questions from the audience here or online? Oh, online, online. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm getting signs over there. Look online. Okay. Um, oh, Rami says, thank you for your answers. I'll definitely share the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rami. Um, someone's asked if there's any chance of the sex lives of African men. No. <laughs> Well, that's your answer there. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from us here before we have up oh, one of you? Yeah. 
Hi, um, I haven't read the book, but um, thank you so much for sharing that. My question is uh, regarding language, since uh, you're encouraging us to share the book with our mothers. Um, but speaking about my own mother, she doesn't read English or um, speak English that well. So how do you, um, how do we give it to African mothers when uh, the language is used, when the language itself is a massive barrier? It's such a wonderful, wonderful question, you know. But I also think part of what is really nice about Africans, especially those of us colonized by the British, is how we've taken over the English language, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you read this book, there's so many expressions from different parts of the continent, mm -hmm. you know. And I kept that in there deliberately because I wanted people to recognize, and even the way that English is written. Mm -hmm. If you're reading a story by somebody from, like, Nigeria, like Bibi's story, it's Nigerian English, mm -hmm. you know. So I think I want to, like, claim English as an African language, mm -hmm. you know. Um, totally. But I agree, I think it's extremely political and extremely important to have language in different stories. I would love for people to like, you know, translate excerpts of the books into their own language and mm -hmm. share with their mothers. I give you permission to do that. Mm. Any other questions from here? Yeah. Mona? Hi, Nana, you know how much I love you. I love you too, Mona. <laughs> We can have a love fest all day. Yes. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you something that I often come across in my own work. Mm. Um, did you ever feel protective about um, the women that you interviewed, especially from the white gaze? Because it's really important to tell our stories as African women, but we also know how the white gaze will um, intervene and, and disrupt. And mm. our people will often say, oh my God, you're giving all this ammunition to white people, yes. you know, to laugh or criticize or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how did you deal with that? Mm. No, that's an excellent question. And definitely I feel very protective over the women who have so graciously shared their stories with mm. me. And I think for me, this is why it was really important to tell a full story, mm. right? So, I mean, I think I myself had to get over some of like my own hesitation because when I started, I really wanted to tell a book that was just about pleasure. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, the media is always portraying women as African women as victims of FGM, you know, as people who are like living with HIV and AIDS. And so at the beginning, it wasn't in my mind that I was going to interview like an African woman who has had FGM or, mm. you know, has HIV and AIDS. But at, as I was doing these interviews, I realized like, actually what's important is our whole story. Mm -hmm. And actually for each person, you really need to show the breadth of their life and not just one narrow aspect, which is what I think the Western media does. Yeah. And so when I got over myself and I had those conversations with people, it was like, oh, this woman who's experienced FGM, gosh, the orgasms that she has, I wish I could have them, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> you know, this woman who has acquired HIV, mm -hmm. you know, she's living a full life. You know, she's found a partner. She's living with a partner who's negative, mm -hmm. who loves her. She has a child who doesn't have HIV. And those are the stories you don't hear in the media. And so, yeah, that's what sort of allowed me to, like, to do that, you know, and not to be scared to deal with subjects that I feel like are very much portrayed in stereotypical ways in Western media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah you, you. You... you give these stories, uh, you give these voices an, an outlet, you know, we see we're always bombarded by negative stories, mm -hmm. by depressing statistics, um, you know, especially in this past year, how abuse cases of uh, or transgender murders mm -hmm. or have just, you know, increased so much over the past year. Uh, in London, there's been, you know, terrible cases of murders and attacks um, in the past year. Um, but your your book doesn't shy away from any of the negative aspects, but it gives um, it gives a, a platform for for these voices to be heard and these personal human uh, stories to be heard and, and names whether they're chosen or not. But uh, it's just incredible what you've done. Thank, Thank you so you. much Thank for you. your book and. Uh, and not just the book, but the festival and the podcast to come. There's a whole universe around, <laughs> around the sex lives of African women. Thanks to you. Thank you. So, <laughs> no, no, that's it. Thank you.
Well, no, no, thank you. I have about 500 more questions. <laughs> but um, I would really like to invite Lydia Luke to share a poem. She is a black woman poet, playwright, and facilitator based in Epsom. Her work has been published by Lungs Project, Amber Gallery, Guts Publishing, and more. She was in the 2020-2021 Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> cohort of the Royal Court's Intro to Playwriting. She co-facilitates PRISM, a writer's group for black women and non-binary people, and is artistic manager of Culford Company. Lydia Luke. Hi. Um, one poem. Oh, can I do more than one? We have five minutes. I'll see how it goes. Hi, I'm Lydia. Nice to meet you all. This has been fab. Thank you so much. I used to work in a bookstore in Brixton and we sold your book and it used to just fly off. So it's exciting listening to you um, talk about it. And thank you, Desta, for inviting me because I love writing about sex and I don't get to talk like read these poems much. <laughs> so this is like the perfect place. This first one is called First Kings. <clears throat> Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Yeah? Cool. First Kings. His eyes are zealous, a destabilizing man, drenched at the altar, permeating my thoughts. Red acrylics trace his lip shape. They welcome and sing to me. Hands grabbing my hips, rain after drought, bent over the bed like Newt, called by Elijah. Teeth grazing my neck, bold as a king's tongue. Give me my daily bread. I live with others, but right now I could care less. Ravens carry me within the ether, no longer noticing I'm in thorough abandon, declared so by God, deep in magenta, slow heat like the Sahara. Please don't refuse me. A tsunami of yeses is all you need to say in a still small voice. Fuck me wild and weepy, thrown from the cliff in midair, I'm surrendered. Swing low, travel sweet, travel sweet. Rejoice in the Lord so much more times and again and again and again. Thank you. Um, I think I would do two more. Yeah. Um, so it was really interesting hearing people talk about um, kind of struggles with like repression and spirituality because I definitely dealt with that and still kind of deal with that. And this is a poem that I wrote a few years ago that I haven't read in a while and feels really girlish, but it's honest and I think it's relevant. And it's called Modesty Verses. This sexting feels esoteric, belonging to a few, not for girls like me who sprouted perched in pews. When the Bible says you cannot, you repress and grip to your teeth, else demons go come and get you, drag you underneath. Roasting like groundnut, legs crossed like a saint, mourning at my coronation as, as the empress of restraint. My body feels malnourished, dormant, out of sight, like darkness broke into my house and sucked out all the light. My mind's at constant war with the desires of its host. Maybe then turns into no, yes is to almost. Boundaries built like Jericho, self-control starched like a gown. Who will march my city seven times, tear this fortress down? My body's supposedly a temple, but worshipped it is not. The divine and her power I seem to have forgot. Is it due to high standards or I deep down feel ashamed? Has fear laid me crippled, forced me neat and chained? Is it the cross that chokes me when hands reach round my neck? Or spectres who lay in waiting to murk me at mention of flesh? I'm told I'm a better, a better woman for it, but I don't believe that to be true. No loving takes me among the gods. I do not writhe in morning dew. However, it's what I have been, a thing I haven't changed. To do what feels, to do what's perceived as meaningless feels dirty and feels strange. Waiting has been no good time, but it's what I've always done. A scissor says, and I sing along, I bust it open for the right one. <laughs> um, I kind of wonder how much time do I have? Okay, I'll see how, I, how it goes after this one. So this one's called Inaugural Ritual to Myself. First time was in the dark, conjuring a satin mist. I oscillated in legato, the room a steady velvet blue. Oya threw a lightning bolt into the sky, Rich semitones arose in me, swelling with volume. I am oranges drizzled in nutmeg and honey, a drippy pigment from the throat. I knew nothing of what lay where I was going, but as, but as with all good things, I gave way and fell with thunder, then rain. 
Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone online here. Thank you, Nana. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a little message, please. Yes, OK. So the Inherited All Our Names event is included in your day pass. So if you come back at 5.30, there'll be a performance of storytelling, poetry, and short films. And again, I would just like to thank Marcel and the whole Africa Rights team for making today and uh, this weekend and this whole month of online amazing events and people possible. So thank you so much and thank you for being here. And if you haven't got the book already, go and get this book. <laughs> Talk about I'll, I'll, I'll side to sign their books as well. Okay, yeah. and you can even get it signed if you grab it today. So do it. <laughs> thank you so much.